Well, welcome to a cold first Wednesday show in February. Uh, and it's supposed to get colder. Uh, wherever you are, stay warm. Uh, during tonight's show, we're going to be talking about Tet uh, and what it is. If you've been around very much, uh, you've probably heard a Vietnam veteran mention Tet or Tet Offensive. Just what is this Tet thing? Before we get started, I want to introduce myself. I forgot to do that. My name is Bill Dixon, North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated. Uh, Lessons of Vietnam show for tonight. And before we get started, though, I want to tell you a few things that are going on if you're in the, uh, in the area and so forth. Uh, this coming Saturday, uh, February the 13th, uh, in Kinston, North Carolina, the uh, Vietnam Veterans of America and uh, a couple other organizations down there are going to be doing a symposium or a uh, thing on Agent Orange. If you're down in the area, go check with G.I. Joe's Museum there on Main Street. And uh, I believe it starts at 10 o'clock. I can't tell you the location where it's at right now, but I believe it starts around 10 o'clock. Uh, and go in that if you and get some information about Agent Orange or go back to our archives and see the show we've done. Uh, March 15th, we will be doing a symposium with the North Carolina History Museum. That's March 15th between 7 and 9 p.m. at the North, at North Carolina Museum of History. Uh, on Edenton Street in Daniels Oratory, we'll be doing a show on post-traumatic stress. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, quite an exciting panel, so if you want to learn more about uh, post-traumatic stress, if you've got it, what you need to do to get taken care of, how to get uh, help, and so forth, be sure to tune in and come back and, and, uh, and come to the symposium. Now, just what is this TET stuff? TET, by all facts and purposes, is Christmas, New Year's, Easter, just about everything there is for the Vietnamese people. Uh, this is 2016 is for the year of the, uh, year of the monkey. And uh, you can see there. And I just want to tell you what I'm thinking about it before I forget it. In 1968, which is the where the big Tet Offensive started, there was a second Tet, but the, the big uh, one that was also 1968 was the year of the monkey. Now, what is this, what is this Tet thing? Well, it's the most important celebration in the Vietnamese culture. The word, or Tet, the whole word is Tet Win Don. Now, if you're looking on your screen, you see N-G-U-Y-N, that is pronounced Win, not Nugan. And that is, or uh, in Vietnamese, that's the feast of the first morning of the first day. And it's in the. It goes along with the uh, Chinese uh, uh, lunar calendar. It's the same same day usually. Uh, sometimes there's a difference, and depending where you are, what part of Vietnam is is what days uh, Tet starts and ends and so forth. Now, how do you get started for? How do the Vietnamese get started for Tet? Well, they start a week or two in advance. Sometimes a month in advance. They start uh, cooking. Uh, getting things ready. Uh, many of Vietnamese prepare for Tet by cooking special holiday foods and cleaning the house. Cleaning the house is an important part. Uh, many customs are practiced during Tet, such as a visiting person's house on the first day of the new year. Now, that's important. The first person who uh, visits your house at the first at that day uh, could set the, the um, uh, how things are for the rest of the year. So uh, quite often the um, head of the household will step out just before the end of the day and then wait outside until the first day of Tet and then walk in to knock on the door and walk into his own house. That way he makes sure that uh, uh, they're responsible for um, uh, how the things are going to be the rest of the year. Uh, they give money. Uh, they give money to children in in, in uh, red uh, red envelopes. Uh, as part of that, it's kind of like Christmas and and, and so forth. Uh, that's when the, uh, uh, the, the the Vietnamese who uh, live in the United States or other countries quite often go back home. Uh, the Buddhists are very uh, ancestor oriented, so they go back home to visit with their people uh, and so forth. Uh, it's also considered them the first day of spring. Uh, they don't deal with the um, uh, Pontiac honey, whatever it is, the groundhog. They have they the Tet is the first day. 
uh, they turn, return home, and there's there's actually a uh, a system who who they visit and how they visit and so forth. Uh, it's uh, it's a national holiday. Uh, almost everything is closed. You don't get anything done. Uh, like I said, the children get the red envelope with their stuff in it. Uh, since the Vietnamese believe that the first visit a family receives in the year determines their fortune for the entire year, as I said. People never enter any house on the first day without being invited first. That act of being the first person to enter a house on Ted's call, and I'm not going to even chance of pronouncing that. You can just read it and make up your own mind what it is. Uh, but it's one of the first rituals. Usually a person of good temper, morality, and success will be the lucky sign for the host family and be invited at first into the house. So you... What you do is you get the most successful, nice person that you can find and invite them to your house, and if you have to pay them, I guess. So they come to your house, the first of uh, first person to come into your house for Tet, uh, and so forth. So. Now, the one, the funny thing that uh, I think my wife would like this part, uh, sweeping during Tet is taboo since it symbolizes sweeping the luck away. That's why they clean before Tet comes along. And uh, doing as far as visiting, it's taboo to visit anybody who's lost uh, lost a family member uh, and so forth. Um, the second day of Tet is usually reserved for friends, while the third day is for teachers who command respect in Vietnam. Local, local Buddhist temples or popular spots are pe as people like to give donations to give their fortune told during Tet. Uh, they're big on fortune telling and gambling. Uh, children are free to spend their new money on tours and or gambling. Uh, even the children get involved in gambling. Uh, the Vietnamese people do like their gambling. They have pup uh, pup puppet shows and everything else going on. Uh, and they don't, it's not just a day, it's a, a week, uh, sometimes three weeks. So if you're going to go to Vietnam, uh, you'll find uh, don't go doing Tet because airline fares are higher, and when you get to Tet, finding a room could be a challenge because uh, people from all over the country and uh, go back home and go to Tet and so forth. Uh, they have parades, and one of the things that uh, that's important is uh, they have. Uh, I used to think they're dragons, but they're not. They're really lions with a dragon's body. It's a um, and they have uh, men and, uh, who get inside these um, things and dance and jump around and so forth. And I'm going to show you some pictures of this, some of that later. But it's uh, the lion is an animal between the the, the lamb, land, excuse me, uh, is an animal between a lion and a dragon. It's a, a symbol of strength in the Vietnamese culture, and it's used to uh, scare away evil spirits. And uh, they get together, uh, have the parades and so forth, and they give the... Uh, uh, the people who dress in the lion, in the lion's costumes, uh, donations and so forth to help them, and so forth. So that kind of gives you an idea what what Tet is. It's um, it's a big big uh, event in uh, in Vietnamese culture, uh, where people visit, uh, eat special foods. Uh, really, just it's a it's a it's kind of like Mardi Gras, I guess, but uh, with everything rolled into one. Now, in 1968, the, we had the big Tet Offensive, and up until that time, because uh, Tet was such a big holiday with North and South Vietnam, with the Communists as well as the South Vietnam, there was always a truce. And that was kind of interesting uh, in Vietnam. You could see at the end of the day, the South Vietnamese soldiers putting their weapons up and going home like it was an eight to five job. And uh, so uh, the communists knew that during the Tet uh, celebration that most of the people would be on leave. There would be little uh, milit South Vietnamese military would be laid back, not doing a whole lot, getting ready for uh, their Tet celebration and so forth. And most of the places they attacked were places uh, that the communists attacked were places that were... Um, uh, manned by the South Vietnamese. Of course, there were some uh, exceptions to that. Uh, on January 31st, 1968, some 70,000 North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces launched a Tet Offensive. And 
the idea of the Tet Offensive was that we were supposed to, uh, in fact, they uh, actually made a tape they had with them. Some of the, some of the communists that were killed uh, had these tapes where they were supposed to play over the uh, Vietnamese radio station, which they were supposed to take uh, and capture in Saigon during the Tet. Uh, they um, had those tapes that was talking about the people rising up and, and throwing out the American uh, military forces and rising up against the South Vietnamese forces, uh, which never happened. Um, now, up until that time, uh, all, our, all of our reports from the military and so forth were telling us how much we were, how we were winning the war and we were just we could see the end in sight and uh, really a lot of bull. Uh, but the people were leaving, was living and then all of a sudden when this um, all these places were attacked at one time, let's see, a hundred cities and towns in South Vietnam were attacked. This is by from people that were. Uh, just about ready to give up, uh, what we've been telling people. And uh, we actually were able to man and, and hold off most of the uh, attacks uh, and, and so forth, with the exception of, the, of Way. Way City was the imperial city of, um, of Vietnam, uh, South Vietnam. It's where the original emperor uh, lived, and he has the forbidden city, just like in China, uh, in China uh, walled city inside the city, where you had to be in the family to get into the inner circle. Uh, the outer circle was guarded by uh, soldiers, and inside that was another wall, and that was guarded by eunuchs. And then inside that wall was uh, some more trusted people, and inside that wall was the emperor and so forth. But uh, they uh, went into that and, um, and fought, and that's where the Marines would. Um, now, if you notice this next slide. I kind of jumped here, and the reason I want to do that because when you were in Vietnam, you got to choose an R&R, &R, that's rest and relaxation, and I chose to meet my wife in Hawaii. This is me catching my, a jeep ride into Tonsonut Air Base, uh, which is not really, it was the uh, domestic uh, flights too. This is me, uh, I know I've gained a couple of people since I, I'll stick this picture, but this is me getting ready to go to meet my wife in Hawaii. Now, this is actually not a circus wagon. This is a Buddhist funeral cart. And I'm riding in the back of a truck after I get to uh, Saigon. I'm riding in the back of a truck, and I've got my camera going as usual. And I kept seeing these uh, Buddhist funeral carts, and I mentioned the guy with me. There must have been a lot of battles that we didn't know about because all these funeral carts are uh, they're everywhere. There must have been a lot of people killed. Now, lo and behold, after the Tet Offense had started and so forth, we discovered that the reason for these funeral carts, these funeral carts here, that's how the commas were smuggling in weapons, explosives, and Viet Cong, uh, the fighters. Uh, that's how they got it in the country. Now, here I am on the plane going to Hawaii, out the window, and uh, that's that's my plane. It landed in uh, landed in uh, Honolulu Airport. Uh, see how pretty that is. Uh, I flew in. I flew to Vietnam in a military plane. I was really happy to fly a TWA Airlines into into um, into Honolulu, Hawaii. And the next picture is I'm greeted at the airport by a young lady in a hula skirt uh, who puts a, a lay around my neck and so forth. And uh, that was exciting. And the next picture uh, is um, Waikiki Beach. Uh, with Diamond Head in the back, and Mr. Uh, your little story here, the military has a uh, hotel uh, military establishment right there on Waukee Beach called Fort DeRussi. Now, I knew people were going on this R&R &R to meet their wives in Hawaii, and they would, oh, I'm not going to stay in the military place. I've had enough of the military. So they went and spent uh, a small fortune staying in these hotels. I decided I was going to try Fort Tarusi. I never saw anybody in uniform. I never saw anything that looked like military. I had a hotel. Uh, my hotel room was right there on Waikiki Beach. We thoroughly enjoyed the week we were there. Uh, but that's Waikiki Beach. Uh, that's my wife and I uh, up on the on the backside of Hawaii, uh, Hawaii, uh, the island of Oahu, uh, enjoying some of the views and so forth. I had never been in a Volkswagen in my entire life. 
I got there and rented one, and after about 20 minutes, I had to go inside and ask the guy how to get it thing in reverse because nobody told me you had to push down and then pull. Uh, so I, it took me a while to get it out of the parking lot. And I don't think I ever made a light the first time. I popped a clutch, and it would cut off, and I'd have to go back and, and do it again. So I have a feeling the people of Hawaii were very happy to see me go. Now, when I got back to Hawaii, uh, from Hawaii to uh, Saigon, uh, it was the day, the first day of, of Tet. Uh, I was in a bus going through town with the wire over the windows and so forth, or firecrackers going off everywhere, uh, no, people all over the streets. I mean, they were just partying and having a good time. And uh, sitting with, in the seat next to me was an Air Force sergeant who had just came back from Japan when you're wounded real bad, they send you to Japan to, uh, to, to, and so forth to get uh, fixed up. And, and, but they sent him back, and he was a nervous wreck because all that fireworks were going off, and all he was, hear, was hearing was uh, uh, bullets and so forth. So I left uh, Saigon that day and went back to my uh, base, which was Long Bend, which is 22 miles north of Saigon. So I uh, got a ride out to, uh, to my base at Long Bend, and checked in there. Everything was fine. It was uh, hunky dory. I uh, went to eat and so forth. And um, that night, they uh, about uh, sometime in the morning, they came in and said, "Okay, get up, get your uh, weapons and so forth. We're on alert." They didn't tell us what was going on. They just said we're on alert. Now, one of my jobs. Now, Long Bend. Uh, make a long story short here. Had fifty-five thousand troops. It was a small city, and you just could not see anything happen in Long Bend. Uh, but outside, or on the edge of perimeter of Long Bend, there was ammo dump, uh, and right up from that was the petrol dump. Uh, but the ammo dump was 11 square miles of ammo pads, and we could hear explosives going off. We could hear things going on. But uh, my job was to go to the talk or the top tactical operations center. Uh, there, and the rest of them were kind of hung loose with the weapons and so forth. Now, I'll give you an idea why the weapons, if you were at Long Bend, your rifles were kept locked in a rifle rack at the end of the, uh, end of the uh, hooch we stayed in, covered in dirt and so forth. And when you went on alert like that, because they wouldn't let us have rifles, we might hurt ourselves here in the combat zone, uh, we had to go find the sergeant who was probably drunk, find the keys from him and open it up so we can get our rifles out. So... Some of the rifles were in pretty bad shape as far as um, uh, care and so forth. But since I went out quite a bit, my mind was usually clean. But uh, then they finally came back and said, okay, the alert's over with. Put your rifles back in the rack, lock them up, and go to breakfast. So I remember I put my rifle in the rack, walked out the door of my hooch with another guy, and looked, and there's this huge mushroom cloud coming up. Looks like something you see in the movie of the atomic blast and so forth. And he says, and you can see a yellowish ring coming out and growing as it came out. And the guy beside me says, what is that? And I said, I don't know. And then as we got up off the ground brushing ourselves off, we realized that was the, um, the flash. You could see the, uh, the uh, shock wave coming at us. And then we heard the noise, and we found out later that um, during the attack on Long Bend was on the side of the ammo dump that sappers, those are the Vietnamese who have... Um, uh, explosives all over their body and they come uh, almost no clothes or, so, or sometimes no clothes at all who crawl through the wires and they went out and put uh, explosives on different pads inside the um, ammo dump and they actually had engineers in there who were taking and disarming some of the explosives but unfortunately, they did not get all of them explode, uh, un disarmed before they went off. I don't remember exactly how many engineers we lost there, but we lost a bunch. Uh, that, uh, but luckily, because it was uh, 11 square miles, if the whole thing had gone off, you'd have heard the shockwave here. But since it only uh, there was different pads and so forth, only a couple of the pads went off. Uh, but it was, uh, it was awesome to see. And it was so funny because the officers who had told us to put our rifles up and so forth were all in the mess hall. And when that boom went off, they were crawling out the doors of the mess hall. Uh, some of them probably had um, need to go uh, over to the train and take care of the things after, after that because uh, they weren't used to that kind of explosive. Now, the next picture was uh, 
a little less than a week later, I was back in Saigon, and this was some of the uh, pictures of Saigon with the blown out buildings and so forth. Uh, th these two pictures, uh, one of the back and then uh, this one, is actually of a building in Saigon. You can see the blue holes in the walls and so forth. Um, what happened was that the, we fought basically two groups in Vietnam. One of the groups we fought down where I, uh, where I was were the Viet Cong or the guerrillas. Now, if you were up in uh, I-Corps, Vietnam also, by the way, was divided up into four different sections. I-Corps, two-corps, three-corps, four-corps. I was in two-corps. Uh, divided up in sections. If you were up in I-Corps, you fought the hard-trained uh, hard, uh, NVA who had the weapons. They had, um, uh, well, they actually had tanks and, and everything else uh, where they were there. Uh, but the, down where I was, and during Tet, most of the people that we were fighting were the Viet Cong. In order to get them out of, of Saigon, we had to go in there and blow up houses and burn buildings and just about everything you can think of. Uh, this building, as you can see, the next building here uh, has a lot of um, uh, bullet holes in the side. Uh, you'll see a lot of these pictures that the photographer has his pictures in the Jeep. I was in a Jeep. And I took a lot of pictures of myself as well as the buildings as, uh, as I was taking pictures, which my captain, who I was supposed to be in the back seat riding security for, uh, pointed out. But this is another building blown up. Uh, and there's some more of uh, buildings blown up in town. There were buildings all around it. Uh, you can see the muzzle of an M14 uh, there sticking up in the picture. Um, there's one of those French cars and, and were blown up and and burn and so forth as you go on through. I took I took these pictures, like I said, about a week after uh, Tet. There was still pretty much in Saigon. It was pretty much gone. There was a few people uh, who were still uh, having to be run out. Uh, the biggest fighting ended up around the, uh, the racetrack. Uh, as I said, the Vietnamese people liked to gamble. There was a horse racing track, and that's where the, um, the communist uh, well, staging area was, was around the racetrack. So it took a while to get them out. One of the biggest uh, places that we had the biggest problems and probably blew away the most was the Sholon section, at C-H-O-L-O-N, uh, in Saigon, it's a suburb of Saigon, and that was the Chinese section. And these pictures, are, I, th I believe, uh, here you see now, are part of the Sholon section. After this, uh, Sholon was uh, considered off-limits. The next picture, you can see all those houses are basically gone, uh, there when, with the blown up building, but that was just one little uh, hut uh, after the other there, and uh, life is still go kind of somewhat going back to normal. You see people going up and down the road and so forth. So, um, but we just about blew, uh, burn up Saigon and blew it up to uh, save it to get people out. Uh, the next picture uh, uh, is Amnon's Jeep. Uh, it's. <laughs> That's the which one? That's an M151. Okay, that's an M151. All right. Uh, I don't know. I'll listen. A Jeep to me is a Jeep, but uh, I, he knows all of them. But this one was, you didn't want to be riding that one. And that's a French car on the back there that the guy's getting ready to get into. It looks like an American guy. That's a Renault. That's a Renault. Okay, with that emblem on there. A lot of Renaults over there because it was French. Now, let's talk about why it was Ted Offensive and so forth. As you know, we talked about it before, it was a celebration of the Lunar New Year, and uh, everybody always uh, took a few days off and went home, and just nothing happened, uh, which was one of the reasons that uh, it was such a surprise, uh, even though uh, they had captured uh, uh, information that there was going to be a big uprising and so forth. Nobody really took it seriously. Uh, before Tet started, there was the Battle of Quezon where the Marines were um, surrounded for, uh, for 77 days in Quezon, and uh, President Johnson had made the statement that uh, he, didn't know, he, he didn't want Quezon to be another damn Dinh Binh Phu. Dinh Binh Phu is when the communists ran out the French. So Westmoreland was trying to pour all of his soldiers in, in around uh, Quezon to... Um, keep the uh, North Vietnamese from overrunning Quezon. Uh, but some of the generals were saying, hold it, let's hold some people back uh, around Saigon area and so forth. 
So thank goodness for that because uh, when they did attack, did come. Uh, Jip, who was the uh, head of the North Vietnamese Army at the time, um, he he uh, put together this plan, and a lot of the, all the all the communist pure, uh, the political group uh, didn't want to have this attack. They just wanted to continue like it was. But he wanted to uh, go out there and see if we could run it and and basically get rid of the alliance between the Americans and the in the South Vietnamese. Uh, the South Vietnamese government had a lot of problems with um, uh, corruption. Uh, they didn't like that the uh, most of the people in Vietnam were Buddhist and the government was Catholic and there was all that going on and so forth. So he felt like that uh, with this big uprising, the people would be have enough nerve to turn against the uh, South Vietnamese government and, and take it over and so forth. And, uh, of course, it didn't happen. Um, If everybody had attacked at the same time, uh, it, it would probably have been uh, made more different. More different. That's a good English word, I tell you. Uh, it would have been uh, bigger, bigger, bigger difference. That's what I was trying to say. But it didn't happen that way. It kind of scattered out. There was some, they attacked a part here. Now, in Saigon, they knew they couldn't take the entire city. Uh, some of the other smaller cities, they, they wanted to take the entire city. But they had certain places in Saigon they wanted to attack, and um, uh, places called Bami Tuat, Pleiku, uh, Nha Trang, Hoi An, which is one of the oldest cities in Vietnam. Uh, the idea was to go in there and um, take over those cities altogether. During, the, uh, during the, all these operations, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese followed a similar pattern. Mortar or rocket attacks were closely followed by massive ground assaults conducted by battalion strength elements of the Viet Cong, sometimes supported by North Vietnamese uh, regulars. The regulars were the ones I was talking about, the uh, hardcore soldiers. These forces were joined with local uh, cadres who uh, served as guides. You had people hard living in these cities who were keeping notes of who uh, speaking about the uh, speaking bad about the government, the teachers, the politicians, uh, the doctors, the educators. All this was so they could uh, go in and get rid of them. Um, but the Allies came together and responded uh, with a real sense of urgency. Uh, they started canceling the leaves uh, that people had, and at three o'clock on January thirty first. North Vietnamese uh, forces started uh, in Saigon. The Sholan section I uh, mentioned. Uh, Jiuden in the capital military district, Quang Tri, again, Wei, uh, Tam Ki, Quang Nong. Uh, U.S. bases at Phu Bai, Chu Lai, in I Corps, Phan Thet, Ha. U.S. installations at uh, Bong Son, An Ke, in Tu Corps, Cantho, and, and Vinh Long, in, in Four Corps. Uh, the following day, Benoit, Long Longthan, and Bing Dong, uh, Bing Duong in, uh, in three corps, uh, which I find interesting here with my notes because Benoit was in, I thought Benoit was in two corps where I was. Um, the total approximately 84,000 uh, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops participated in the attack while thousands of others stood by to act as reinforcements as blocking forces. Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces also mortared or rocketed every major airfield, uh, airline airfield, and attacked 64 district capitals and scores of smaller towns. So uh, they went into right outside of Benoit, which was right next door to uh, Long Ben. They went into the POW camp and um, freed the POWs. The uh, communist Viet POWs were there. They also uh, went into the Widow's Village and uh, killed a lot of the people there in the Willis Village. Uh, in most cases, the defense uh, held up against the communists, uh, even though the, a lot of the, Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese people uh, were on, uh, or military were on the, um, <clears throat> were celebrating their holiday and so forth. Uh, they did hold out very well. Uh, as uh, last show, Dick Ellis was talking about uh, where he was staying in a, in a uh, uh, villa there in Saigon, and when Tet started, they had to end up breaking up bed slats to use it, having weapons just in case because they didn't have anything else. But um, basically, the Viet Cong were stopped 
or slowed down. It may have taken a day or two to get some of them out. But um, important part to remember, uh, a lot you hear, sometimes you hear Vietnam veterans speak uh, ill of the South Vietnamese soldiers. You'll find that during this Tet Offensive and the things were going on, the South Vietnamese soldiers held their place and none of them uh, broke and ran as, as a unit. One of the problems the South Vietnamese military has, the government was corrupt. In order to be uh, a high-ranking officer, you could have no knowledge whatsoever of the military. If your family had enough money, they could buy you a, be it, as a colonel or general, and you suddenly became a general or a colonel of the military, and you didn't know how to train your soldiers because you didn't have any training. And let's just say that the South Vietnamese military will give you $3 a day for every soldier. Well, you keep a dollar of that and give the other $2 to the soldier. Well, now let's come out, come, well, they need to go on patrol. You don't want them to go out there and get shot on patrol because that would be $3, that would be a uh, dollar ahead that you're losing. So quite often you would let the Viet Cong know that you were coming out there uh, so they could be out of the way. Or when they came under attack, uh, you didn't have any good training, no discipline, and they broke and quite often would break and run uh, because they had no, uh, no training, no, no, uh, no military substance at all. You didn't have the sergeants and so forth to uh, keep them and, and uh, keep discipline and so forth. It was just almost like a, uh, a mob, a rabble of, of loose soldiers. So you did have... From time to time, you can go on to uh, come under uh, gunfire and look around, and all your allies of the South Vietnamese soldiers were gone. But then you had the Rangers and the Marines and some of the other units that were just crack units and so forth. Uh, although Saigon was the focal point of the offensive, the Communists did not seek a total takeover of the city, which I mentioned. Rather, they had six primary targets to strike in the downtown area. The headquarters at Arvin, that was the Army the Republic of Vietnam, general staff at Tonsonut Air Base. That was the air base that I came in coming back from um, Hawaii, r and &R. The Independence Palace, uh, which is we call the President's Palace. The U.S. Embassy in Saigon, the Republic of Vietnam Navy headquarters, and the National Radio Station. The reason they wanted a National Radio Station was, I mentioned a while ago, they wanted to... Uh, go in and play these propaganda tapes over the radio to see if they could help the people get out there and, and, and turn against the, their own government and so forth. Uh, but they never got there. Uh, the, the radio station, hell. Uh, I remember seeing uh, later on the news where they were talking about uh, how the Viet Cong got inside the embassy. No, they did not. There was a fence around the embassy. Now, the embassy, all they had around the embassy as far as guards was some MPs. Now, all, of, all military guys are trained to uh, weapons and so forth, but you've got the infantry guys and you've got the MPs. The MPs are not used to uh, and don't have the equipment pretty much that the infantry guys do. So they came under attack, and uh, a couple of them were killed real, real quick because they, the guys were coming up and driving up in civilian cars, getting out, and... Um, they, they thought they were just rugged guys until they started shooting at them. They blew a hole in the wall and got inside the wall, but never got in the embassy. There was a building there that one of the embassy workers was in, the, was in there, uh, and somehow or another they threw a gun up to him, a pistol, and there was a guy actually went into the uh, Viet Cong, went into the vestibule, not the embassy, but one of the other buildings there, and he shot him, but the... Uh, Communists never got inside the embassy per se. But uh, you heard the news, you would have thought the embassy was ransacked, burned, and pillaged, and everything else. Um, they attacked the central police station, and there's the um, artillery command, and artillery command headquarters. Uh, they were supposed to go in and capture all these places, but it didn't happen. The defense of the capital military zone, the area around the capital was the uh, was considered the capital military zone, and it was a, a South Vietnamese uh, responsibility uh, to maintain that. And also, the because of the corruption and so forth, the president of South Vietnam uh, kept some of the crack troops right there close to him so to make sure there was no coups or, or going on anything else. 
Um, a South Vietnamese responsibility was initially defended by eight Arvin infantry battalions and local police force. By February 3rd, they had been in, reinforced by five Arvin battalions, five Marine Corps, and five Arvin Air, Airborne battalions, and U.S. Army units participated in defense, included the 716th Military Police Battalion, seven infantry battalions, one mechanized, and six artillery units. That was uh, what was sent into uh, going to Saigon uh, because it was, again, that when you're fighting the Viet Cong along with the people, it was hard to tell the good guys and the bad guys, except they, unless they shot at you, then it was, of course, it was sometimes too late to know that they were bad guys. The national radio station was a symbolic uh, main target for the communists uh, because they could go in and start propag uh, propagizing and so forth about the uh, general uprising and so forth. But uh, uh, they, they were uh, sacrificed themselves because they never got there. As I mentioned a while ago, at 2:45, it was attacked. The embassy was attacked by a 19-man sniper team, sapper team that blew a hole in the eight-foot-high uh, surrounding wall and charged through. With the officers killed in an initial attack and their attempt to gain access to the building having failed, the sappers simply occupied the chancery grounds until they were killed or captured. In other words, they didn't have anybody to tell them what to do. Uh, as I was mentioned a while ago with the South Vietnamese troops, uh, their officers and non-coms were killed initially by the Marines excuse me, the MPs, so those guys just kind of hung around and uh, got killed. Uh, I think there was two they captured when it was all over. By 9.20, the embassy grounds were secured with the loss of five uh, MPs. Uh, the next picture are the MPs uh, holding off the Viet Cong uh, with two of the MPs that we, that we lost. As you can see, they had uh, M16s and sidearms, but that's about all they had to uh, uh, there at the embassy and so forth. Small squads of Viet Cong uh, just went out across the city, and they were going to uh, the barracks where they knew the people were. They were going to look for those uh, blacklist people, the teachers. Uh, the communists you know, like to uh, do away with the teachers, uh, doctors, uh, anybody that would have some education. If you if you had a college education, your probably your name was probably on somebody's blacklist. So they had groups going out. Uh, wandering through town looking for individuals who had on their list to do them weigh in and, uh, and police officers and so forth. Now, this next picture is uh, an important picture. This is the picture that probably lost the war. The photographer took this picture just as the colonel here, the South Vietnamese colonel, shot this guy in the head. And it was sent all over the world is how brutal the South Vietnamese were treating their prisons and so forth. But it's a bigger story to it. This photographer, Edward T. Adams, actually apologized to the colonel for taking this picture. Years later, even when they were both living in the United States, the photographer continued to uh, apologize for the colonel for taking this picture. This guy you see him shooting here in, in civilian clothes was actually a friend of the, of the colonel's, and he had just got through killing some of the colonel's men and their families. So the colonel was uh, kind of uh, worked up, of course, and in the spur of the moment uh, put the gun in the guy's head and blew it, and you can see it, and there's video of it also. You can see the side of his head come out. But uh, it was just it was just one of the defining moments. It's kind of like the little girl running down the street with the napalm that uh, was how bad the, the, North, the United States was bombing children and so forth. And uh, the fact is that the United States had nothing to do with that bombing whatsoever. But this picture just was resounding all over the country. It was uh, uh, the talk of everybody about uh, him shooting this guy, but nobody ever asked about the... Um, Action of reasons and so forth, and and, and so forth. Uh, I, it may not been still not been ju uh, justified, but it, sometimes when you're under heavy combat, uh, there is no way to take prisoners. Uh, outside outside of the uh, 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 city, uh, two Viet Cong battalions attacked the United logistical head, uh, headquarters complex at Long Bend, where I was, as I mentioned. Bien Hoa Air Base was struck by a battalion. 
We used to be able to sit uh, up on sandbags out in front of my company area and look out across the plains into Benoit Air Base and watch them um, get rocket attacked uh, on a regular basis. And quite often as your plane was approaching, uh, the comets would drop in a couple mortar rounds as your plane was coming in, kind of welcoming you to the country. Um, Tonsonut Air Base, which was at the time was right on the edge of the city, now it's kind of in the middle of Saigon. Uh, Arvin paratroopers were uh, waiting transportation to Nang, but they went instead into action and halted the attack. A total of 35 Comets battalions, many of whose troops were undercover uh, cadres who had lived and worked within the capital or its environs for years. In other words, uh, people who are going into Long Bend. Every day we had, South, we had Vietnamese going into Long Bend to do different jobs and so forth on Long Bend, and a lot of those were, uh, were communists. Uh, like I said, it's hard to tell the good guys and the bad guys. You had people in the city government in Saigon and Benoit uh, who were part of the communist government, and uh, it was just, and they were just all of a sudden they started out uh, with uh, a red bandana around their head so they would know who they were, but um, the, the uh, photo uh, racetrack, where I mentioned a while ago, was where they were, they were staging uh, a lot of uh, destruction, bitter hand-to-hand -hand combat, door-to-door. Uh, -door. Uh, and those hooches, you didn't go in there and kick the door in or throw a grenade in real, if you weren't real careful because the walls were so thin, if you threw a grenade in, you were too close, you're going to get it too. So um, it was hard. You had to actually, somebody had to go in most of those uh, buildings and, and find the Viet Cong and get them out and so forth. And also, at the same time as you're going in, because the people are still living in, in those, in those uh, huts and so forth, you had to go in there and try to uh, ascertain who was a good guy and who was a bad guy and shoot the bad guy before he shot you. And that's, uh, it, was a lot, it was a lot of American soldiers uh, uh, had problems and, and were killed during, doing that because uh, they were hesitating to find out because uh, they didn't want to kill anybody. Now... Most of the operations and so forth were taken care of, as I said, uh, quickly, but the imperial city of Wei were just overrun with communists. They were just, uh, they had, uh, well, according to what you see here, 45,000 communists went into Wei. Now, part of the problem was because this Wei was the imperial city, it had a lot of political historic and religious uh, symbols to the people of South Vietnam, we went in there and would not let the planes go in and drop bombs. Uh, no heavy artillery was allowed in the town. It was basically hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, close-up quarterback uh, uh, fighting, going uh, from door to door and so forth uh, because we didn't want to destroy the city, as you saw from some of the pictures we did in Saigon at the time. Uh, so they had to go and fight and fight. And the Marines were into, uh, uh, went into Saigon, and sometimes it would take them a day to get a half a block going, going from door to door. And if they pulled back a little bit, next thing they know, they had to go back in and do the same thing all over again. Uh, we killed 45,000 uh, communist soldiers uh, during that battle. South Vietnamese suffered 2,788 killed, 8,299 wounded, and United States and other Allied forces suffered 1,536 killed, 7,764 wounded, and 11 missing uh, in there. But um, I've talked to some of the Marines who were there at Way, and it was, um, well, it was, it was really, really a mess. Like I said, there was... Uh, Bodies everywhere. You couldn't. You couldn't. You you didn't want to use the heavy artillery. Uh, they used people instead. Uh, it was hard to move. Getting people when you got a wound, it was hard to get them out. Uh, they called for um, uh, reinforcements. The problem was there was one road going in the way, and one and that one one road going out of way, and the communists set up ambushes. So as columns of armored personnel carriers and trucks and men were coming down the road. They were all ambushed, and it took them days to fight their way through to get to way just to help reinforce the Marines and so forth. 
which was another another reason that, that it took so long to get out. Now they did start to use a little heavier weapons uh, and at, later on because they realized the only way they're going to get them out. Uh, as I mentioned a while ago, Way was the imperial uh, capital of, of Vietnam when the emperor was there. Uh, it, with the inner city, it's uh, if you've ever seen anything about the Forbidden City in China, it was very similar to that. This is the entrance uh, to the Citadel uh, there. Uh, some of the walls are like 14 foot thick. Uh, the emperor had, uh, it was, it would take some stuff. And today, if you go to the Citadel and the Imperial City, you can still see the bullet holes and bullet marks and uh, and so forth in the walls. The walls are all pockmarked. Uh, from all the uh, bullet holes and artillery and uh, heavy caliber weapons and so forth, but not the uh, explosives and so forth. And it's a beautiful place now to go visit. Um, the river, there's a river that runs right beside this called the Perfume River, and at 3.40 on the foggy morning of the 31st of January, Allied defenses positions north of the Perfume River in the city of Way were mortared and rocketed and then attacked by two battalions of the 6th Communist Regiment. Their target was the Arvin 1st Division headquarters, uh, located in the Citadel, which I showed you the picture of, a uh, three-square-mile uh, complex of palaces, parks, and residences. Uh, the, the fortress, or the um, Imperial City, was built in the 19th century. Uh, the undermanned Arvin forces, because you remember everybody had gone home for Tet, uh, did a pretty good job of holding them out for a while. Uh, they blew the bridge going into uh that part of the city until the Marines got there. The battle lasted 25 days and it became one of the longest single, uh, bloodiest single battles of the Vietnam War. Now, Quezon was 77 days, but uh, it wasn't as intense a battle unless you were there. If you were at Quezon, it was pretty intense, but that were mostly mortared and, and shell artillery and so forth. This was hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, door door-to-door combat and so forth uh, to get, get them out of way. Uh, during the first days of the North Vietnamese occupation, uh, U.S. intelligence vastly underestimated the number of uh, communist troops. Uh, we, uh, the generals and so forth thought it was a small group, so they just sent a few, few Marines in there, and then they realized that uh, there was more there they talked about and thought about. That's the reason they were having such a hard time fighting from door to door uh, because there were so many uh, communists there in the city, and Normally, you would think about the, the communists uh, would, would, sh would fight a little bit and run, but these guys dug in and were not going to run. Uh, they were, they were going to stay there to whatever, and uh, they fought long and hard and never underestimate the, uh, the communist soldier, especially there in way, the uh, regular, uh, regular army soldiers. Uh, they were well-trained, and they didn't break and run much. Uh, the uh, communist Viet Cong, uh, would break and run and hide and so forth to fight another day. But the Arvin so the um, uh, communist uh, regular soldiers, they stayed and fight. Uh, it was basically a, a very deadly and uh, a fight and so forth. Outside way, uh, the U.S. Air Cav Division and the 101st Airborne Division uh, tried to get into town, as I said, to uh, cut uh, and also cut off the supplies because the, the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese communists knew they were going to be surrounded, but they were trying to still get supplies in through the Perfume River, so they had boats and sandpans coming in with as much as they could with, because they, um, they had to get the, the, weapon, the uh, medicine for the wounded and they had to get uh, bullets for their guns. And the food, a lot of, and some of the food, but a lot of the food they got from the people uh, and who were there and so forth. Uh, by the time of, by the time the, uh, after a couple of days there, uh, the paddle of 16 to 18 communist battalions, that was between 8,000 and 11,000 men were taking part in the fighting for the city itself. And everything around, on all the approaches were, 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 co were covered by the, um, the communists and so forth. So it was hard to, it was hard to get in there to do anything. In the aftermath of the recapture of the city, uh, the discovery of several mass graves. I mentioned a while ago, you had these military units who were uh, uh, tasked with the, uh, the job of going around and finding the teachers, the educated, and so forth, and roll up and, and bring them all up together. And they did, and they killed them. 
uh, and put them in mass graves. Um, after the after the initial battle, they found uh, s several mass graves. Uh, the last one, which was discovered in 1970, of uh, South Vietnamese citizens of Way, and they were clubbed and shot. And there was uh, 2,800 civilians that were believed to be potentially hostile uh, to communist control that were killed. In other words, the communists went and and uh, collected 2,800 civilians and children, women, men, old men, everything, and killed them and put them in mass graves so nobody would see them. Uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, people who were fighting. Uh, you know, you hear stories about uh, My Lai and uh, which was a mistake where the American soldiers uh, went in and things got out of hand and a riot kind of thing and killed uh, a couple hundred South Viet or South Vietnamese civilians. Uh, it was wrong. It shouldn't have happened. But here, and they celebrate the My Lai every day, every year in Vietnam. But they never mentioned the 2,800 of their own people they killed during the Battle of of uh, of Way at, during Tet. And, uh, they just it's kind of selective selective memory I guess you know Vietnam was the first TV war it was the first war we've ever had that you could be sitting down at dinner and the news would come on and it would tell about uh, the body count for the day uh, one of the ways we could tell whether you win or losing was how many comets we killed and so forth uh, so they would come on and give the body count there was X number of comets killed that day and all this stuff going on so as you were sitting down to dinner and uh, you were sitting on the news and the talking head at that time was, the, was a man by the name of Walter Conkite. Walter Conkite was the most trusted, listened to man in the United States at that time. And he had always been somewhat of a um, hawkish on the war and so forth in, in Vietnam, uh, talking about it and, and so forth. But when Tet came along, everybody was surprised. He went. He uh, left his uh, talking uh, talking uh, desk there, uh, where he was the uh, head reporter there, and went over to Vietnam. Was actually in Way City. Now I was told that he reported from Way City, and this is by a reliable source who says they have the pictures, that he is standing in a hotel in Way giving his, his news report, and there's uh, artillery rounds going off behind him, mortars coming in, and what he had actually done was he had hired the Marines to go in there and drop mortars and artillery rounds behind him so it looked good for his report. But he was so influential, and he came out and said that there was no way we could win this war. We had fought to a stalemate, and there was nothing going to happen. There was no way we needed to leave Vietnam and so forth. And that's when President Johnson came up and made his statement was, if I've lost Conkite, I've lost middle America. In other words, it was all over if he lost them. And some people like to say, uh, as a result, that's the reason he uh, decided not to run for office again, to get out of office. Uh, he didn't fight the war uh, the same way. Uh, he just basically wanted out of it. Uh, just because uh, Walter, Con Walter Concrete, as I like to call him, uh, changed the war. Uh, I've talked to press people who said, no, the, the media didn't have anything to do with the war, didn't have anything about the end of the war and us pulling out and so forth. And I've always said, uh, bull pucky, uh, that um, the media reporting uh, their news and so forth with the uh, sound bites, uh, they never really tell the, the full stories. I know that my wife would tell, call me sometimes, or not call me because uh, I didn't have a telephone, but she would write me a letter going, are you okay? I saw where Long Bend was under attack. And I knew nothing about Long Bend under attack. I'm in a place with 55,000 troops, a small city. They could attack the other side of Long Bend, and I wouldn't know about it. But the news media came along, and Long Bend, uh, largest depot in, in the world, uh, there would uh, second field forces headquarters was attacked uh, and it could be a little outpost out from it uh, who got maybe uh, a sniper fire a couple of uh, bullets and so forth was under attack so they only showed you snippets of whatever uh, they uh, wanted you to hear and wanted to see they kind of um, decided 
uh, censored, I guess would be a good way to put it, what you saw and what you didn't see. And the best place, if you're sitting down at the dinner table and you're talking and you see this come on and you discuss what's going on with the kids and so forth. So the whole war was um, uh, kind of, uh, was, uh, like I said, it was, it was fascinating if you were back home watching on TV and so forth. The thing about it was, during Tet, which was the turning point of the war, we annihilated the Viet Cong as a fighting unit. The guerrillas were no longer basically a, a, a whole unit together. They had to start using a uh, regular army to come into two corps and uh, three corps and so forth to uh, help fight in the, in the communist area. Uh, we just basically wiped them out. We won, we won all the battles and lost the war for Tet 68. It's amazing. We were winning everything. Uh, we were kicking their butt. But because of the turning point with uh, the American people and the, and the press changing the way they were reporting, reporting the way they wanted you to sit, think that the whole war concept changed and so forth. Now, uh, the next one is uh, basically a, a patch that you can get. Uh, I am a Tet survivor. I was there for Tet. And uh, it's an interesting patch that a lot of, a lot of guys get. Uh, because if you look on the wall during 1968, which was the biggest time with the Tet and so forth for American soldiers, there's more American soldiers on the wall for 1968 than any other time. Now, we just had celebration here in Raleigh of Tet 2016. I can tell you, I, was, I went to that one. It's a lot different from the Tet 68. Uh, the Vietnamese American Association in Webb County uh, had their Tet Festival there at the Car Scott Building at the fairground, uh, lots of music and so forth. And uh, it's also, was this year is also the year of the monkey, just like 1968. Uh, the next one is the program for the uh, Tet Festival, uh, so forth. But uh, moving right along, as you come into the entrance, as you can see, some of the, uh, some of the women uh, and are dressed in some of the traditional uh, Vietnamese, and then you've got people dressed in uh, regular American clothes and Vietnamese. That's one of the entrances there. Uh, thing. This was the stage where they performing dancers and uh, kids and all sang and so forth. You'll see some more pictures of that later. Uh, moving right along. There is the, uh, uh, on the stage with the uh, playing of the South Vietnamese anthem and the uh, United States anthem because most of these people are United States citizens. They are Vietnamese Americans. As you can see, they're standing there with their hand over the heart uh, and saluting. Uh, it was quite a, uh, quite a, uh, uh, actually, that is Millbrook High School's ROTC was doing the uh, flag. This next picture, uh, this is a, a gentleman that comes to all our POW services, and I see him everywhere. He's in a traditional out outfit there, uh, the blue with the white uh, circles on it. I think that's a Buddhist outfit. Uh, I don't know his name. If I did, I still couldn't pronounce it. Um, but I really like it. We always salute each other. And to his left, would you see the red beret? That is uh, Colonel Henvo. When Saigon fell, he was a, he was a uh, major. And even after Saigon fell, they were told to surrender. He fought for another uh, a little over a month before he finally laid down his weapons. And he spent the next... Uh, right at nine years in slave labor camp. Now, the guy bending over next to him, uh, his name is Kong. Uh, I find that very interesting. We were fighting the communist uh, Viet Cong, and that's his name is Kong, and he was also one of the uh, former South Vietnamese soldiers who um, uh, spent time in, in that. For some reason, I got the same picture of the entrance there. Uh, I don't know. I guess I liked it a whole lot or something. There's uh, Hen Vo with his wife, his lovely wife, uh, standing in front of the uh, uh, orange blossoms and so forth. Uh, like I said, he spent uh, 10 years. He loves his country, but he won't go back. Um, he, uh, if you go back to one of our shows on the POWs, he talks about the slave labor camps. He talks about living in through communism and how fantastic uh, our freedoms are. Uh, he really is uh, very adamant about the freedoms and so forth of what we have here in the United States. That's Kong and his wife. Uh, there, and uh, the next one is one of the uh, banners uh, showing a picture of uh, uh, 
a Vietnamese uh, writer, uh, educated guy. Uh, this gentleman here, his name is Fat. That's his name. He also was one of the ones who was fought with the colonel uh, for um, uh, about 30 days after. He also spent uh, ten years, right at uh, nine to ten years in re-education camp. He owns one of my favorite uh, Vietnamese restaurant now uh, uh, here in Raleigh. Uh, go there often and eat with him. And it's amazing to me how how much they uh, still speak Vietnamese uh, there. And back behind you, you can see some of the pictures and so forth. Now, this is one of my favorite guys here. This is we call him the LT. He's a lieutenant. Uh, they help us raise money for the uh, projects we do over in over in Vietnam, and there's nobody gets by the lieutenant here without getting a contribution. And uh, I just went. I was just honored to be uh, invited to his daughter's uh, college graduation. Uh, thank the world of him, uh, so forth. Now this guy, I forgot his name. I see him all the time. He was in the South Vietnamese Navy for the uniform. Uh, I have a feeling these are not the same uniforms they had back then because I know I couldn't get in mine. There's some of the ladies uh, who are standing there when they're out eyes, uh, who are getting ready to sing. As you notice, the band is, is, is kids. The next one is uh, these Vietnamese kids that you see here. Uh, they have a future that the, the kids back during the war did not have. You can see they're dressed in traditional uh, Vietnamese uniform. Uh, these, these kids are just, uh, they're very spectacular, really super kids. Uh, the next picture, the, the one on their left there is some of the high school students are singing. Uh, I forgot the song they're singing, but it was good. Uh, this lady is dressed in, and a guy is dressed up in traditional Vietnamese, uh, and she's singing, but she's singing in Vietnamese, so I have no idea what she's singing. Now, I mentioned a while ago the lines. Uh, this is four of the lines up on stage, and you can't tell it from the pictures, but they're shaking their butt. And uh, the next pictures, they're coming. They're coming down. There's actually three people in this uh, in these outfits. You've got a hind leg, you got a front leg, and a guy up on the shoulders of this guy, uh, other, with the heads. And you can see the heads. And what they're doing is they dance around. Uh, and every so often, they raise up, and the whole head was like ten feet high or whatever. Uh, it's awesome to see them. And the next picture, as you can see, they're they're giving contributions or donations to the uh, to the line to the line dragons. And the person with the uh, right in front of the lady, behind the lady, uh, I'm not certain exactly. Other than that person, kind of leads the line dragon around to the right place where they're supposed to be, so they don't fall over or something, I guess. Uh, but it's the kids are just all around. It. It's a really a big thing. Uh, while we're there, you can see some of the people. Uh, that is a Vietnam vet there who married one of the, uh, I don't, he was from Federal. He actually married uh, a Vietnamese while he was in, um, uh, there he was in Vietnam six years. And uh, to show you that I was there, uh, this is me. And if you look at this picture, remember me standing in front of the Jeep? Uh, there's been a few changes uh, back then. Well, I've gotten a lot older and my wife is, hair is definitely different. I'm a little broader. I've, I've, I've broadened my horizons. And uh, that is Tet and uh, Tet's, uh, the real Tet, what Tet's all about, and Tet Offensive. Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, March 15th, we're doing the uh, PTSD uh, symposium at the North Carolina History Museum. Uh, come join us for that. And later on, I'm going to be giving you more information about the Vietnam experience, April 1st, 2nd, 3rd, which was the play. Thank you for tuning in with us tonight and looking forward to seeing you February 24th for our other show. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brock, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Parent Dome with Ryan Miller, Current Affairs with Omnon Nissan. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, 
follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.